we have Rusty. Um, if uh, you're uh, willing to go with a, another uh, a big database, I mean, the uh, whole EPA initiative that led to the 2007 Future of Toxicity report um, should be recognized here, and Rusty was part of that group and in, in, in that process, so we go right ahead. Um, well, I appreciate being here. It was really interesting to uh, hear a lot of the talks this morning about the history. Um, I appreciated learning about some of that, some of that I didn't know and didn't appreciate. And I probably wasn't, uh, was pretty young when some of that occurred. Um, but uh, hopefully I can talk to you a little bit about uh, what uh, we're doing there to try to build some of the future and sort of do that transition as Thomas talked about, that handoff, and trying to build the future of uh, the three R's in toxicity testing. Right. So I think, you know, it's always appropriate. I mean, uh, last year I turned 50, so I had a self-reflection about where, whether the, uh, you know, half my life was over and what I'd achieve versus what I'd have for the future. And I think at the 60th anniversary, it's, it's appropriate to look at, too, about, um, you know, the, to reflect on the three R's and, and the, the 60th anniversary as well, right? And there are a couple perspectives that you can, you can take, right? It's a glass half full, half glass half empty type of approach. You think about it, it's been 60 years, right? If you want to take more on the left side, half full, uh, or half empty, it should be the other way around. I meant to switch those. Um, but if you take the half empty approach, um, you know, 60 years, right? Um, we went to the moon in much less time, although for much more money than the 500 million that uh, was spent on uh, uh, some of the replacement work in Europe. Um, and we have a, an iPhone in my pocket that has uh, um, significant computing power, and we have a lot of new advances, right? But yet, we haven't necessarily achieved some of the goals of the three R's, which is the com uh, complete uh, elimination of animal testing, in, at least in the chemicals we use, right? Um, that's the kind of the half empty, and I think uh, I'm more on the half full side. And I think that uh, as we talked about with, and we heard some of the earlier talks here, I think the, the, the future is really building in terms of the opportunities to make a significant headway over the next decade or so. And I think that the future, that future is here, right? And one of the reasons I say that is, you know, we talked about uh, not only some of the work that started the uh, CompTOX Center, right, and the 2007 report, but also the fact that, uh, as Julia pointed out, the memo that was released uh, um, a few months ago, um, talking about the, the goals of the current administrator for reducing animal tests significantly by 30% by, um, you know, I think in the next 10 years, as well as a complete elimination by 2035, right? That's a pretty aggressive goal, right? Um, and uh, also to come as close as possible to excluding reliance on mammalian tests from the approval process, which is, although subject to a lot of the legal mumbo jumbo that they all throw in there to provide appropriate caveats, but that's a, a pretty uh, ambitious goal for the agency to declare, right? Setting a, a stake in the ground and saying this is what we hope to achieve, right? Um, but uh, he also outlined a few things, and I'll touch upon this uh, a little bit later, that that work plan that we're supposed to develop uh, um, in six months, by the way, um, is to, we want to ensure the new approach methods are equivalent to or better than the animal test. This is kind of similar to the language that if you've read the TOS, new TOSCA bill is kind of uh, worded in there, that we need to have a equivalent or better, whatever that means, um, than the existing test of which we base, base our public health and safety regulations on. We want to make sure that they're applicable to use and risk assessment and protective of human health in the environment. Uh, we also want to develop a plan to adopt more flexible regulatory requirements, right? That's kind of an interesting uh, caveat to that. How can we make our regulations more flexible to use these NAMs? We heard uh, earlier with the ICH and some of the other presentations is very rigid regulations um, kind of act to inhibit uh, innovation and the adoption of some of these alternatives. So how can we make our current regulations more flexible? Um, also, we want to include outreach to stakeholders, which is a good thing as well as establish baselines, measurements, and uh, mechanisms to track progress. We want to be held accountable to these uh, um, goals, right? You want to hold us accountable, and we want to achieve them, right? And so all these things are wrapped up into this work plan that we're supposed to develop, right? Um, but it's, uh, um, as we heard, and why, it's, why we're 60 years in and we still haven't completely eliminated is it's a complex problem, right? It, it is, right? Both societal right, establishing all the precedents we have to work through, right, not only technologically, 
but all these other issues that are all wrapped up into adopting the three R's and really replacing animal testing, right? And I think that it's really uh, um, an issue if you begin to think of that complex problem, um, that there is a real simple, neat, and uh, solution, because usually that's wrong, right? And something that you've probably heard from Nicole and something that I'm going to reinforce here is that it isn't a simple solution and that hopefully we're going to achieve that success by integrating a lot of other different tools in order to uh, develop those uh, safety related approaches to make those uh, optimal decisions, right? Um, and it's all about uh, kind of combining things like setting expectations on what the variability and relevance of those current toxicity tests are. Right, that was mandated in the memo as well as in the law. Um, a lot of you here have already begun to set those expectations. Uh, we're moving to kind of reinforce them and expand them a bit. Uh, we also want to develop those new methods and technologies and, and sort of uh, fill in the gaps. We want to continue the development efforts that occurred, but also fill in many of the gaps and refine them where we believe that uh, we need to. Um, also, Case studies, uh, Julia mentioned that case studies are really important, demonstrating applicability for particular different decision contexts. That's really important, and we'll show a little bit of that. And then last, uh, I believe it's important, and, and I think Nicole showed this too, that you want to take all this complex data, and because you're making this complex problem and trying to make it uh, uh, understandable and consumable, to regulators, right? You have to give them the tools in order to make it understandable and consumable. And that's also a problem that we're trying to tackle. So it combines all of these things in order to make progress. One solution, I will argue, is really not going to achieve success. Right? So we'll start off with setting expectations. Um, so one of the things that uh, Nicole talked about was ToxRef 2.0, right? So we've continued to curate legacy toxicity data. Um, make use of that data that's been already been collected. And also now we're having an opportunity to recycle it and use it for setting those expectations on what um, is equivalent or better, right, that laid out in the, both the memo and the law, right? And ToxRef 2.0 is an updated version, includes all the species and different tox kinds of toxicity tests. On the left-hand side, about 1,200 chemicals, uh, a little over 3,000 studies. Uh, and one thing that we began to ask in order to set those expectations is, uh, and building on some of the work that's been done previously, is how reproducible are they, right? That's been shown for a number of different studies, um, but not really comprehensively for repeat dose toxicity studies. And for repeat dose toxicity studies, these target organ effects, do you see the same target organ effects reproducible, re reproducibility, reproducibly in repeat dose toxicity studies? And, and, you know, depending on your target organ, it ranges from 50 to 70 to a little bit 80% of the time, um, depending on your organ and your species. So that kind of bounds the qualitative reproducibility of, of uh, target organ toxicity in these animal tests. But more importantly, and where ToxRefDB 2.0 comes in is we made the ToxRefDB more quantitative. We included all the uh, dose response data in there, as well as an appreciation for what endpoints were measured, um, but not positive. Um, and so Katie Paul and others in the center began to try to evaluate that data um, in a very rigorous statistical way to say, okay, if you get a low adverse effect level, a low AL in an animal study, how reproducible is that low AL, right? Um, and that's a very difficult uh, question to ask because you don't really ru uh, um, run a repeat dose 90-day study or a chronic bioassay multiple times, right? It's kind of frowned upon, and rightfully so. So it's a difficult question to answer. Um, but there are some um, data out there that when you analyze it and pull that legacy toxicity data, you can begin to answer that question. On the, on the left-hand side, we took two different rigorous statistical approaches. I won't go into the detail on those, but also different study types. One is the chronic uh, repeat dose toxicity study. One is the subchronic, And the y-axis is called the root mean square error. It's essentially a measure of how reproducible those studies are when you control for all the other covariates, when you control for things like dose route, um, the strain that was used in the study, um, the different uh, other factors that you can control for that are named in the different uh, uh, study descriptors. So when you control for all that metadata, okay, how reproducible is that low adverse effect level? And on the right, um, using a root mean, screen, uh, root mean square error of about 0.5 to 0.9, uh, the 95%, and that should be a prediction interval of the low adverse effect level, um, 
that's about a hundredfold range, right? Um, so when you get a low AL out of a repeat dose toxicity study, it's about tenfold on either side, um, your, your prediction interval. And what a prediction interval says is if you ran that study again, right, that is a 95% prediction interval, which you'd expect the next low AL to fall within that interval. And it's about a hundredfold big, right? So is that, uh, that's setting that expectation for how good your new approach methods, your alternative methods have to be quantitatively in order to replace uh, an animal study, right? And it also sets some bounds on your R squared value. If you want to do a correlation with your alternative in silico model, your best R squared value that you could probably ever get is about 0.7 uh, correlation uh, or, or R squared value, right? And so that also sets bounds for how well, should you want to predict an animal study, how well that should, uh, how predictive should it should be and how uh, predictive it could be in a maximal way. All right, developing new approach methods um, as well as new technologies to apply to some of those problems, All right? Um, so these are some of the portfolio of scientific advances and I won't go into a lot of these that we're working on currently in the new center. Right? And these cover everything from trying to develop technologies to uh, new ways to screen chemicals. I'll touch upon a little bit of that um, in a high throughput way. Also a way to, uh, in, in, in not just measuring the molecular and cellular changes associated with those chemicals, but also evaluating function. I'll touch up on some of the work that Tim Schafer's doing to measure uh, changes in the uh, brain on a chip or neuroelectrical activity as well as our ways to fix some of the Achilles heel of these in vitro assays that have been dogging the alternative field for some time. Um, and touch upon very briefly some of the more 3D on a chip model, but I won't go into that since I think uh, Horst went into that in pretty uh, big detail. But the rest of these, I, I just don't have time to touch on a lot of the work that we're doing in order to apply the dose context that Nicole talked about, also the more uh, complex three-dimensional uh, modeling that we're going on and computationally to show that in an agent-based modeling, that, that morphological changes um, that occur from disrupting those signaling pathways, um, and then also putting it in a risk uh, context with the high throughput exposure modeling. Um, but one of the things that's important that we believe, at least in the um, innovations in the high throughput screening, is to um, develop approaches that are comprehensive, that are viewed by regulators as covering um, all, all biological space, right? On the left-hand side, there's something called an artist had began drawing um, multiple decades ago. And what he began drawing was what he thought was, at least in pop culture terms, was a picture of everything, right? And I think this in a live form is like uh, 25 feet tall. Um, and I don't know how many feet wide, but he attempted to take everything pop culture and put it on one mural, right? And he's been adding to that over multiple decades. And for him, this is his picture of everything, right? And then you can think about it in toxicology as we're trying to, for regulatory and public health concerns too, create a picture of everything, right? A picture of everything that could go wrong with biology um, based on uh, chemical disruption. That's what that's the standards that at least some people believe that our, our, our battery of rodent models provide, right? And on the right-hand side, even though ToxCast is being used um, to evaluate all these different icities, right, that's the amount of biology that we currently cover in ToxCast. And that's a really small slice in terms of gene recovery and even optimistically from pathway coverage. So right now, it doesn't give you that, at least in our view, that picture of everything. So what technologies can we begin to fold in to try to, to address that particular concern, right? Um, so we've been taking a number of years now, and it feels working in the government slower than what I like, um, but we've been trying to incorporate newer technologies to begin to build that picture of everything. Um, thousands of chemicals, multiple cell types to cover biological space, as well as now, now that I'm in a new center, um, I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end, uh, multiple species. Um, begin to screen all these different cell types and multiple species in concentration response using some of these high content technologies. Uh, Julia talked about the high throughput transcriptomics, which I really won't touch upon because I think many of you are already familiar with uh, transcriptomic technology. But I'll touch upon a little bit of the uh, phenotypic profiling that we're uh, beginning to use in, in, in the laboratory to begin to characterize that, uh, those phenotypic changes on a cellular basis. And then beginning from that high dimensional data, begin to try to infer mode of action where possible, 
I will argue that many of the chemicals, at least in the environmental chemicals that we're regulating on, there really isn't, for most chemicals, a predominant mode of action. Um, and then also do some concentration response uh, modeling of those pathway and uh, um, mechanistic based effects. The reason we do that is it's still uh, relatively cheap, uh, depending on how you do it. It's automatable, and we can give a broad coverage of those molecular and phenotypic responses. Um, here's some uh, a quick data, a quick snapshot of data from our phenotypic profiling. And, and for those of you not familiar with phenotypic profiling, it's quite an interesting technology. It was really, um, it started before the Broad with high content imaging, but the Broad Institute at uh, MIT really sort of stepped it up a notch, sort of uh, put it on steroids. And essentially taking um, dyes that stain different cellular compartments. Um, these are different dyes that are on the, the y-axis on the far left-hand side. You can see the dyes there. They stain the, the nucleus, the RNA, the, um, the, the, the actin filaments, the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria. And then uh, through taking a lot of, micro, micro, uh, a lot of uh, um, microscopic pictures of it, you look at all those different dyes in different cellular compartments and different features of those fluorophores, things like texture, intensity, um, the shape of those objects. And essentially, if you do the two-dimensional matrix of those dyes and the, all those different measurements you're measuring on each dye, you get about um, uh, 1,300 different uh, phenotypic features that describe essentially the pathological state of that cell. Right? And so that sort of de describes, at least at that point in time, at that concentration that you treat in that particular cell, what that chemical is doing morphologically to that cell. You can kind of think of it as cellular pathology. Right? Um, and you can see that in the middle of this concentration response, here's a couple different uh, uh, chemicals that do very, uh, have almost a fingerprint of mechanistically of how it affects that pathology. In one case, you're having the uh, actin and, and the cellular um, um, sort of uh, cytoskeleton being uh, uh, perturbed first, followed by other um, cellular features. In other cases, you're looking at uh, changes in the DNA and mitochondria that are being triggered first at different concentrations. And that fingerprint is actually unique depending on the mechanism of action of those chemicals. And on the right-hand side, this is kind of getting at some of the things that um, um, the case studies that will be going on later is we've been comparing the disruption of the cellular pathology uh, on a dose basis with we're beginning to see how that uh, compares with when you begin to see effects on a low adverse effect level in animal studies. Right? And it typically, what we saw for the majority of, of chemicals we've looked at so far, uh, that you begin to see these cellular effects on a dose basis that precede a low adverse effect level um, in animals. Meaning that if you were able to set a, 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 a point of departure based on cellular pathology, most of the times that would be protective um, based on uh, what you would see in animal studies. And I'll show you a little bit more of that when we do that in a case study. But this is showing these cellular uh, phenotypic effects so are sort of protective of those in vivo effects more broadly. And, and I will point out that most of them, uh, from a risk-based perspective, are still way above where you have exposure, meaning that you can do, still do a risk-based characterization of those uh, points of departure. Uh, we've also been, and this is one of two different methods we've been trying to incorporate that Achilles heel and address that Achilles heel in vitro studies, uh, incorporating metabolism in, uh, um, and being able to retrofit um, our in vitro high throughput screening assays with metabolism. This is something called AMI, uh, which is essentially incorporating S9 into, and immobilizing it in alginate gels and putting them on these little pegs um, that are on these um, specially designed plate lids. These plate lids then, the pegs then sit down in the wells and they metabolize the chemicals in the wells. We, we call it the liver on a stick. Right? And we've been working on using this liver on a stick technology to retrofit our, one of our uh, endocrine disruptor assays, endocrine disrupting screening assays, particularly the ER transactivation assay. Um, one unique thing about that and why it's somewhat of a challenge is you actually have to characterize the, the performance of that assay uh, in, in different ways than any of those assays have been validated before. Right? Uh, and this is where some of the challenges come in. Right? You have to characterize the, the performance of the liver on a stick, how well your metabolism metabolizing that uh, particular chemical, and you have to characterize the performance of that assay uh, without the metabolism as well. 
right? And so you have to almost do a four-dimensional matrix of the performance of that assay uh, with both metabolizing positive and negative, as well as with your reference chemicals um, in positive negative way as well in that uh, performance. The, la the other thing that I will add is uh, when you begin to characterize the performance of those assays, it's very hard to find reference chemicals for those that are bioactivated um, um, to become more endocrine active, right? Um, actually, there was only really one um, that we could find that we could begin to base and characterize the performance of that. Right? So we began to screen a number of, of, uh, of chemicals uh, where we in silico predicted those that were likely to be bioactivated. Here's a whole stretch of chemicals uh, on the top that we found when we screened this relatively small, about 100 chemical library. Um, and those you could see from uh, methoxychlor, which was supposed to be the, the standard bioactivated chemical, you can see on the uh, left-hand side. And then transtilbene, you can see a very switch-like response uh, that that was back, uh, bioactivated to a more endocrine active chemical, um, and all the way to azobenzene. So all those, at least on top, were really bioactivated to a much more potent estrogenic, efficacious estrogenic form. On the left-hand side, these are the ones that are detoxified um, to a less estrogenic form, right? Everything from dibutyl phthalate uh, to, and I point out, the benzyl butyl phthalate on the right. Interestingly enough, that one was run it in a eutertrophic assay, and was actually negative in the eutertrophic assay because it was likely metabolized. But our, if we would have uh, validated uh, against the eutertrophic with our uh, in vitro assays, that would have been uh, a false positive, right? But when you incorporate metabolism, you now see why that was negative because uh, the bioactivation and the metabolism turned that uh, uh, in vitro assay into a negative, right? So this is all important in terms of incorporating metabolism. Um, I'm going to go quickly because I think I'm running out of time. Functional assays to predict developmental neurotoxicity. Um, this is some of the work by Tim Schaefer, who is really beginning to move across and move beyond some of these, uh, um, um, I would say, either both cellular pathology as well as molecular assays, incorporating function, particularly neurofunction, into our assays. And it's brain on a chip technology to try to predict a very difficult endpoint called developmental neurotoxicity. Um, using these cortical neurons, neur neurons to begin exposing them and beginning to analyze the dose response behavior and then characterizing the performance against those reference chemicals. So not only do we, are we trying to incorporate and begin to screen chemicals from a molecular basis, but also on a functional basis to begin putting that larger piece of the puzzle together uh, to more holistically begin to characterize toxicity. Um, and lastly, uh, we begin to also develop organotypic, uh, organs on a chip type technology. This is the first, uh, we believe, um, sort of reconstituting a, uh, what we call a thyrolical, which is essentially a thyroid follicle in a dish, taking human primary uh, thyrocytes, um, letting them self-assemble in culture, um, and then beginning to characterize them for um, chemicals that inhibit thyroid function. It's the first time I think we uh, have uh, seen in the literature where you can actually inhibit the production of thyroid hormone um, chemically um, based on these in vitro culture systems. So yes, there is some value in sort of developing those organs and tissues um, to act as a higher tier, kind of a tier two screen to say, okay, I've, I've perturbed um, certain uh, um, cellular functions that I know exist uh, in thyroid, like TPO, Right, and other sort of uh, sodium iodide symporters that we know are exist, and I can do my high throughput screening on those individual targets, but what functionally do they have an effect on in terms of an organ or tissue? And this provides a demonstration that this does have an effect in certain cases on thyroid function. Um, lastly, case studies. We're doing this, we're, I'll skip over this, but we're developing a defined approach at the OECD uh, for integrating all those uh, ER assays into uh, a, a defined approach to predict uh, um, ER disruption, right? This is important in that we're not just going to say we're predicting it with all 16 ToxCast assays, but we're trying to take a modular approach to it so we can say, okay, what, say you only have access to four assays, and one of them is a QSAR model. Right? How well do those four assays or three assays plus a QSAR model um, perform against the reference chemicals? Right? So if you're a company and you can only commercially acquire two or three of those assays and you can run a in silico model for free, right? do you have adequate performance for predicting an endocrine disruptor? 
right? And how can we, in a defined approach, very systematic way, begin to look at all different combinations of how well those in vitro assays and in silico approaches perform and, and integrate that into a defined approach and have it acceptable for regulatory decision making. Um, the last case study is this regulatory focused case study on bioactivity as a point of departure, right? And this is the issue of, okay, do we have to predict or know the mechanism of everything? Is it really important, right? Or does bioactivity, um, can, it, can we use bioactivity quantitatively to get a first order guess of what a point of departure is for a risk assessment? And this is probably predicated a lot on many of our environmental and industrial chemicals being very promiscuous in their modes of action. You know, likely it's not just uh, messing with uh, one particular meta, uh, molecular target, um, but it's pretty much disrupting at the, in a very narrow dose spacing your mitochondria, you're uh, messing with the plasma membrane and inhibiting a little bit on your endoplasmic reticulum and all sorts of bad things, right? Um, these things aren't made to target one um, um, biological process, right? They're made to make my cell phone faster, right? And hopefully it does a good job at that. Right, um, and so in this particular case, we took 400 chemicals where there was uh, repeat dose toxicity. Um, and this includes both developmental, reproductive, uh, subchronic, and chronic studies, right? Pulled out their low adverse effect level, right? And then took and an, an looked across uh, ToxCast for all of its strengths and weaknesses and saying, what is the fifth percentile most sensitive assay in ToxCast, okay? Converted that to a dose equivalent and saying, does bioactivity in ToxCast, how does it compare with uh, a low address effect level in, in, uh, um, across all these different animal studies, right? Um, and for about 90% of the chemicals, that point of departure in uh, the NAM space, bioactivity, um, was conservative and protective of what that low adverse effect level was in animals uh, across developmental, reproductive, subchronic, and chronic, saying that, yeah, it's a protective point of departure. If you want to run these in vitro assays, bioactivity gives you um, typically on average within a hundredfold of where you have a low adverse effect level in, in, uh, um, in an animal study. And, but it's less conservative than a TCC. The thing that we really missed on was, and predominantly, where that 10% comes from is the fact that we did a really poor job at predicting neurotoxicity uh, from organophosphates and carbamates, right? We know we kind of stink at neurotoxicants, and that's one thing we need to up our game on. But by and large, bioactivity, and I would argue that uh, more relevant bioactivity would do a much better job at predicting uh, low adverse effect level um, should you want to in animal studies, but it's an actually a, uh, a, an understandable way of setting uh, points of departure in animal studies. And I will skip over the visualization and translation, give you the take home messages. I would say that uh, uh, I think we're, the future is bright for beginning to continue to incorporate three R's into um, these integrated solutions to move to that next level of making this a reality. Um, and that uh, part of that is uh, we need to, based on the law and based on the administrator's memo, establish what those continue to establish what those expectations are for the variability and relevance of those animal studies. Um, develop and refine, continue to refine technologies to screen those chemicals and uh, make them more relevant. Um, also, systematically address these limitations that we've all um, complained about. Right? And then also partnering with regulators on uh, um, many of those case studies to begin to show how they can be applied to regulatory decision making. That last case study that I sh uh, showed you had involved ECHA and Health Canada and, and our regulators from the EPA demonstrating how we could apply bioactivity as a point of departure. And we do need to enable new technologies and make them more consumable by our regulatory colleagues. And with that uh, acknowledgments, I am now part of, I'm no, NCCT is no longer um, uh, one unit, it's been dissolved, and we're now the Center for Computational Toxicology and Exposure, about 450 dedicated individuals now, kind of grew a lot since the old NCCT days, includes everything from the biomolecular screening group, more chemistry and exposure-based technologies, we have uh, an eco division, Right, uh, what was used to be Duluth, and we now have a new and a, and a first for ORD, which is a scientific computing division, to really make that next step in terms of translation from a scientific computing and developing these tools and translational technologies a reality. Um, and with that, 
There's one more ecotox challenge we're trying to develop that omics set for many eco species as well. So I encourage you if you have a technology to participate. And thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here.